FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 10 18 Year is rapidly coming to a close. As always, be a part of the show. Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Well, just when you think things couldn't get any worse in higher ed, safe zones and safe spaces and lack of diversity of thought and everything else, well, we've got somebody here from the front lines. Uh, professor Warren Treadgold is with us. He's a professor at St. Louis University in St. Louis, and he's been writing uh, vociferously about the degradation and the deterioration of higher education in America. And Professor, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you pre-call you were saying uh, higher the colleges, higher education keep getting worse and worse. What exactly is going wrong there? Well, an enormous number of things are going wrong, but uh, one of the things that that uh, I'm talking about mostly is the complete uh, hammer lock that left wing opinion has on American universities by now. I've been in this game for quite a while. I've uh, I went to graduate school first in 1970. My PhD is from 1977, and every year since then it seems it's gotten worse, which is unusual in history. Actually, as an historian, I don't you don't see this very much that everything comes all in one direction. You certainly don't see it in politics where. Uh, different opinions and different uh, policies go up and down. Different parties are on top. Uh, here, there is a form of, of leftism that now everybody is getting familiar with as it enters national politics, but it used to be very much a fringe phenomenon. Even in the universities, it was a fringe phenomenon, and every year now it gets uh, more and more uh, utterly, totally dominant on American campuses. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little distressing. Hey, we won't even get into uh, the lowering of standards of students and uh, academic requirements and affirmative action and all that. So just the lack of diversity of opinions. We've seen people from the right, even from the center, being assaulted on college campuses. We've seen speakers being shouted out and shut down. And what is it that the left fears of free and open discussion? Why are they so vehemently opposed to academic freedom, Professor? Well, this doctrine that is now has now taken hold on campuses doesn't really have a name and doesn't really have a set of rules. It's a vague feeling. Uh, well, not a vague feeling, but a, a, a an emotional rather than an intellectual kind of conviction that the world is made up of a small group of oppressors and a large group of oppressed. The United States broadly is among, is among the oppressors. And you really have to defend this without paying any attention to the facts. That's another thing that has grown up during the time that I've been around. Postmodernism, the idea that nothing is true, but everything is an instrument of power. So if you say something, it doesn't matter whether it's logically coherent. It doesn't matter whether it's factually correct. What matters is that it should serve the interests of the oppressed in their struggle, their uh, desperate struggle with the oppressors, and the oppressed are, uh, well, they're practically everybody that you know, and the mm -hmm. oppressive are people who are vague shadows in the background, but uh, the oppressed, of course, include uh, various minorities, women who are, are majority, but nonetheless are included, and uh, then the oppressors are, well, essentially anybody who disagrees with this leftist consensus, and you have to shout those people down 
because even giving them a platform is an evil thing to do. Even uh, listening to them is an evil thing to do. So, of course, you don't want diversity of opinion. You want the bad guys silenced. Yeah. So, so words matter, and evidently they feel very threatened by them. And where did this come from? It's, it's really anti-intellectualism when you get down to it, Professor, isn't it? It's very anti-intellectual, and I think it is fair to say that it has sort of two different strands. It started out as, in the 60s, as Marxism, as fairly orthodox Marxism. But the trouble with orthodox Marxism is that it's in favor of the working class. And the working class in America in the 60s, and even now, is largely pretty conservative and rather religious and pretty patriotic, and that wasn't what these people wanted at all. So they had to find a new group of people who were being oppressed, and they found them in blacks and women, in uh, Hispanics, in homosexuals, in uh, all sorts of different groups. And that was that kind of revised Marxism is one kind of thing. The idea that nothing is true, though, and that everything is an instrument of power, is this postmodernism that goes back to uh, people. Well, Michel Foucault is the name that many people have heard of, though Herbert Marcuse adapted it to Marxism. And that didn't originally start out to be part of Marxism either. Marx, Marx wouldn't have said that uh, nothing is true and everything is an instrument of power. He would have said, no, Marxism is true. Uh, what I'm saying is objectively absolutely right. It's scientific. It's, uh, it's material. But that didn't work so well in America in the 60s, and it hasn't worked so well since, because the truth of it is that blacks and Hispanics and, and uh, women and, and other minorities are not terribly oppressed in America. In fact, in many cases, they've been given all sorts of preferences on campuses, certainly. But it really helps if you can deny all the facts and all the arguments and don't have to argue for that. And that was po what postmodernism gave these people. So you put those two things together in a sort of semi-coherent kind of philosophy and shout down everybody else, and you get what we've got on American campuses today. Yeah. So is there any trend here? Do, do we have any reason for hope, Professor, that maybe we're going to turn the corner and end this campus oppression? Well, I don't see any very clear signs of any improvement. In fact, I see clear signs of everything's getting worse every year, which, as I say, is extraordinary. I wouldn't have expected it. Yet, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a lot of people thought that the trend was all in favor of communism until communism abruptly fell in 1989-1991. But uh, mm -hmm. that hasn't happened yet, and it's unlikely to happen in anything like that way because the people who have this doctrine are now firmly in control of American universities, and I don't know who's going to overthrow them. You'll notice that when there are protests on campus, campuses, they're mostly against outside speakers. And the reason is that there aren't people inside, there aren't professors, there aren't uh, certainly administrators, there usually aren't students uh, who are challenging this consensus. You have to get an outside speaker to do it. Right. So that's it. So, so it's the outside speakers. Now, the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, has said that he's going to start suing colleges for oppressing and suppressing opposing views. How far can that really go? Well, I mean, it might help a little the problem of demonstrations against outside speakers, though I wonder about it. Uh, the truth of it is that a few outside speakers don't make very much difference on campus. It's just that these people, these students especially, and some faculty, who want to demonstrate against the oppressor don't have any real targets on campus. And in fact, in many ways, they welcome these outside speakers because it lets them find somebody to protest against. Yeah. So, so everybody's a victim now, right, Professor? Are you a victim? 
Well, I don't like the term. Uh, it's, of course, you know, according to them, it's not that everybody's a victim. All the good guys are victims, but they're also a bunch of bad guys, and they aren't victims. And they'd say I'm one of them, even though, in fact, uh, if I were so unwise as to express my views very loudly on campus, I'd find all sorts of demonstrations against me. And I'm certainly, my views are a major liability. If I were applying for jobs right now in mm -hmm. academics, I probably uh, wouldn't have gotten one. I'm, uh, I've been here for 20 years, and I think I probably would not have been hired here even I certainly wouldn't be hired here now I wouldn't have been hired here 10 years ago probably not even 50 so you're years unemployable ago. thank goodness for tenure huh <laughs> yes well you know a lot of people are against tenure but the truth of it is it's one of the few things that really are protecting the few remaining conservative professors yeah and is there any place where we might be getting new conservative professors from or are you guys dinosaurs fsn radio it's all about what's next egypt is on the verge once again becoming a world-renowned gold producer the golden age is being rediscovered for millennia ancient egyptian kingdoms prospered from unparalleled riches pharaohs built their empires and flaunted their abundant wealth that was made possible by the country's resource rich gold deposits despite this rich history modern egypt remains one of the most underdeveloped gold mining countries in the world Aton resources is at the center of the modern egyptian mining world diligently working both as the only public exploration company in egypt today and as the advocate for mining reform with the egyptian government However, those that arrive early, like Aton, will reap the best rewards. Aton's discovery of the legendary lost mountain of gold at Rod Ruin and its current aggressive drilling program there could potentially reap those rewards. Aton Resources is focused on its 100% owned Abu Marawat concession in the Arabian Nubian Shield, located 200 kilometers north of Sentiman Sakari's world class gold mine. Aton possesses first mover advantage in the underfollowed jurisdiction of Egypt, which is currently undergoing mining reform. To stay on top of Aton's latest drill results and news, go to AtonResources.com. Aton trades on the TSX-V under the ticker AAN and on the OTC under the ticker ANLBF. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Well, we're, we are to an astonishing extent dinosaurs. If you... Mm. I mean, you can guess from from the years that I quoted to you that I'm the sort of person who is nearing retirement. And if I don't retire, you know, I'm not going to live forever. I've, our, the sorts of people who have the kinds of views that I have are getting to be gray and old and uh, on our way out. And we're not being replaced by new such people at all. Those, the new hires are all have all bought into this left-wing postmodernist consensus. So in the future, you can see that something pretty alarming is going to happen. The graduate schools may not discriminate against conservatives at the, I think they probably do a little, at the level of admitting people to graduate school. But mm -hmm. if once you're there, uh, you continue to hold conservative views, you're going to find that you're in a very unfriendly place. Mm -hmm. And especially when you go on the job market, you'd better... In fact, you can try to suppress your views, but if you're, even if you're in a field like ancient medieval history, my own, if you don't make your scholarship all about uh, identifying groups of oppressors and oppressed in whatever field you're talking about, and it could be English literature, sociology, anthropology, uh, economics, it can be essentially anything as well as history. If you don't do that kind of scholarship and just do traditional scholarship, where you look at the facts and, and you try to identify what was actually going on, which, of course, one of the things that goes on in history sometimes is oppression. There is oppression in history. There, there is some mm -hmm. of it. But uh, it isn't the only thing that happened in history or English or economics or sociology. If, but if you don't pretend that it is, you're very unlikely to get a job, at, at least at most places. There are a tiny mm -hmm. fringe of conservative institutions that 
uh, would be open to hiring you, but they don't have very many positions, and they aren't very important in American higher education today. Yeah, so you sound downright pessimistic. Maybe, maybe we need to be importing professors from Eastern Europe and uh, for parts of the world where they really were oppressed, and they really know the meaning of oppression. Oh, that's, well, but of course they wouldn't be hired. The departments don't want them. The administrations don't want them. The, uh, you can find such people. In fact, I've, uh, in this book that I've just written on American universities, I've proposed starting a new conservative university, a, a conservative elitist un- elite university. But, uh, and I think that if you put together the conservative professors from, and there are huge numbers of professors, we're dealing with about one and a half million professors in America today. And if you got the best ones from the hundreds of, of American colleges and universities, you could staff a faculty for a university the size of Princeton with about a thousand faculty. And you could get people from, from abroad, you could get people from the press, you could get people of various kinds of expertise who are outside academics. It, uh, you could still get the, that number of people. It's not a very large proportion of the huge mm-hmm. numbers of professors out there. And in fact, I don't know quite how many there are because a lot of them are smart enough to keep quiet and you don't understand their conservatives until uh, you give them a chance to express themselves. <laughs> But so the problem isn't so much finding faculty, though, if they, you tried to staff 10 major conservative universities, you'd run out of people. But for mm-hmm. one per, for one uh, American university, you could definitely do it. Yeah. Well, obviously, something needs to change here. Uh, what kind of solutions? What can we do to change this? Well, I'd really the the solution that I think is most likely to make a difference that uh, would really turn things around is a major new conservative university that really tried to be the best in the country. And I don't think it would be very hard because postmodernism makes it very difficult to be good and according to traditional criteria. All that really requires is for donors who are now giving their money to places, well, to all sorts of places, but primarily to the big name institutions like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, and so on, and uh, a certain number of others, well, quite a few others, to give some of that money and quite a lot of it to start out with to a new conservative university. That would really help. I make some other proposals. One is for an academic honesty commission to uh, vet the research of professors in the humanities and social sciences the way it's already done in the natural in the natural sciences. There is a uh, national uh, science foundation of uh, committee that that that's research that is outright fraudulent in the natural sciences, but there's nothing comparable in the social sciences and humanities, not even for plagiarism if you steal somebody else's work. If somebody finds out, it can be publicized, and the professor in in question might lose his job, but that sort of thing, there is no uh, there is no national agency to look into research in most of uh, what universities do, mm-hmm. and I think it would discover some pretty horrifying things because when you believe nothing is true, you believe everything is permitted, and you can get away with really, really bad research. That's very. Simple. I've also suggested legislation to limit the role of administration, and what a lot of people outside the universities don't seem to understand and why a number of them are in favor of uh, abolishing tenure, is that the real villains in this are not just professors, in fact, not primarily professors. They're university administrators who are very left-wing and are encouraging universities to go in a left-wing direction and who are behind a great deal of the inflation of costs of American universities because, well, for example, Harvard spends 40% of its budget on administration alone, and Mm -hmm. it's absolutely unnecessary. That's taking money away from research and teaching and everything else. 
Caltech, for example, which is an excellent school, spends 5% of its uh, annual budget on administration. 5%? And that really? shows you what can be done and what should be done, really, in all uh, American universities. Well, it makes a lot of sense, Professor. Hey, if we want to find out more about you, get your book, where do we go? Uh, it, all you have to do is, well, Amazon.com is the obvious place. You could also go to Encounter Books, my publisher, and probably other bookstores. It's called The University We Need, Reforming American Higher Education. And it can't happen soon enough. And, you know, uh, pr Professor, we didn't even get into the quality of scholarship and how then standards, the erosion of standards and how that's all gone down the tubes. I mean, we could spend a whole show just on that. Anyways, yes, <laughs> anyways we'll have a link uh, over to your book in the show notes of this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Don't forget to write us, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Professor, it's a pleasure. Keep up the great work, and we can only wish you much success. Thanks, and thanks for having me. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.